Welcome to Smart News Digital, July 16, 2018. So today we are going to see all these topics. So the first article is a welcome move. So recently the Telecom Commission has approved the TROI recommendations on net neutrality. So this is to secure the rights of the internet users all over the country. So what this TROI recommendations is or what is this TROI or what is this net neutrality? So we are going to see one by one. So the TROI is Telecom Regulatory Authority of India. So it is the organization which is responsible for uh, fixing the tariffs for each and every internet service provider as well as the telecom operators. So what is this net neutrality in the sense? Everyone who is using the internet has to be provided the equal services regardless of what their content is or regardless of what their uh, services or applications they are using. So this is what the net neutrality aims at. So if you see here uh, the net neutrality's aim, all the traffic on the internet must be treated equally by the internet service providers. That means, so if we are using the internet, then all the content should be equally accessible to each and every user. So that is the first major aim of the net neutrality. The second one is all sites must be equally accessible to everyone. So whatever the site is, it should be equally accessible to everyone regardless of the content present in those websites. And also the same data cost to access a site. So the charge that they are putting on each and every site that should be equal to every individual. So that is what this net neutrality aims at. And also there should be no zero rate. For example, uh, some free services, uh, which means certain applications are providing at a free cost and certain applications are providing at a charge rate. So this is no, not net neutrality, right? So it is like putting one application at an advantageous position than another application. So obviously it is not ensuring the net neutrality. So no zero rating. No zero rating in the sense certain applications are providing at a free cost and certain applications are providing at a charge rate. This is not net neutrality, right? So net neutrality in the sense each and every application should be provided at a free cost or each and every application should be provided for a charge rate which is same for every individual despite the content. So this is what actually it aims at. So putting certain applications at an advantageous position than another application is not net neutrality. So the Telecom Commission recently approved for this net neutrality recommendations to this ISPs and telcos, right? Which means, so what are these ISPs or telcos are supposed to do? So these internet service providers are ones who are uh, actually doing what you access. So they are the one who are deciding what each and every user should access and how fast the content should be available to each and every individual and how much to pay services which are getting accessed by each and every individual so all these accessing and speed as well as how much they charge these things are decided by this ISPs so now the try is putting recommendations to these ISPs in order to control and in order to maintain the net neutrality over all the applications as well as for the services which is provided so by means of implementing this try recommendations India will now have a strong net neutrality regulations so for example, <clears throat> we all know that the information that flow uh, via the in network is in the forms of bits like zeros and ones. So there should be no discrimination on the basis of the content that flows over the internet, right? So it is after all zeros and ones that are flowing through the internet. So you should not discriminate that content. If you see in this picture, net neutrality in the sense all the internet users can go on the same speed uh, by whenever they are using this internet services. But if you see in this case, if at all you are going to pay for some services, then you are obviously going in a very uh, speeder phase in the sense you are getting a very fast internet service over other. So it is not equality. So preference is given uh, to one person than another is not equality. So it is not net neutrality's concept. For example, Atel is the largest telecom service provider in the world. A few years back, actually it planned to implement or it planned to charge for the over the top services such as Skype, WhatsApp, Viber, etc. But by means of try interruption, Atel actually stopped that plan. Similarly, internet.org, see here. So it is like a collection of websites which is made available freely for the certain set of subscribers. So this is also not what this net neutrality is actually aiming at. Similarly, Atel zero in the sense, uh, for example, Flipkart is paying some amount of money to Atel to make the Flipkart available.
available freely to each and every uh, individual so what about the competitors like snapdeal and all so if flipkart is available freely to the every subscriber then obviously everyone is going toward flipkart and not to, towards this snapdeal or amazon.com so it actually demotivates the competition which is prevailing in the uh, indian economy so it violates the spirit of uh, competition in the market so for example if flipkart is obviously going to uh, provide free services to the customers in the sense they are going to access the flipkart at free as well as at a speeder rate than amazon or uh, snapdeal so it is also putting this net neutrality's aim at par so the second topic is be cautious in shifting to dbt which means direct benefit transfer so the rbi has recently advised all the states that are planning to shift to cash transfer to be cautious why because uh, recently the problems experienced by three union territories puducherry chandigarh and dadra nagar haveli in adopting to this direct benefit transfer for food grains or food subsidies to the people is not that much good in implementing so the people or the poor people or find it difficult to get the money uh, via this direct benefit transfer so they just wanted to revert back to the old system where they are getting the foods at the pds system that is very much convenient for them rather than getting this direct benefit transfer so this is uh, this is what warned this rbi to advise the states to be very careful while if you are trying to implement this cash transfer to every households so why uh, this dbt is getting implemented in the sense for two major reasons one is the cash transfer is an alternative to pds system which is the public distribution system so in public distribution system the people are just going and getting the food grains they needed uh, directly instead of cash so this is what we followed before that is this this is what the pds system is but now by means of implementing this cash transfer directly or direct benefit transfer to the people or the households so by means of adopting this direct benefit transfer now they actually reduced the physical movement of the food grains from one place to another place and it also reduced the leakage of the food or wastage of the food efficiently also in each and every state the consumption of the food uh, it is also varies right so it is different for each and every state and within the state also the consumption pattern varies so on taking this into account also they are making this direct benefit transfer as a possible way to choose or to give greater autonomy to the people to choose their consumption basket if you provide money to the people they can get the money and they can go to the market directly and purchase the food whatever they want according to their consumption pattern and also dbt is looking as a way for uh, reducing the leakage in the pds system because under food security act national food security act we want to ensure the uh, security of food grains to each and every households but by means of leakage in the pds it is not getting implemented successfully all over the country so to block that or to restrict the leakage also the government want to implement this direct benefit transfer but while implementing this dbt they are facing certain problems so the first one is inadequacy of transfers to maintain the pre dbt consumption level in the sense before implementing this dbt itself uh, the people are getting food grains at a subsidized price in the markets at a good amount only okay. they are enjoying their entitlements in a good way itself before but now after this dbt implementation it is what they are stating here is the inadequacy in the transfers in the sense it is not reaching the people uh, so far what it is actually aimed at so this is a major problem so second one is insufficiency of of last mile delivery so this transfer of cash or direct benefit transfer to the people or to the household is not reaching the last mile connectivity it is not reaching every individual who are actually entitled to so the second major problem is insufficiency of last mile delivery in the sense by means of implementing this dbt we are transferring the ca uh, cash to the directly to the bank account of the poor households but while implementing this it is not actually uh, reaches the last mile delivery which means it is not reaching every household who are entitled to because they are not uh, they are not having the access to the bank account or they are not having access to the um services provided by the government and also the third one is a weak grievance redressal system if at all a people is not getting what they are supposed to get like they are actually supposed to get the direct cash right but if they are not getting that then there should be a grievance redressal mechanism so that they can go and complain and get what they actually have to get but the uh, the grievance redressal mechanism system is also not that much strong it is weak in our government so these are all the problems in implementing dbt this is what they suggest so what they actually 
actually aimed at is now deviating. So this is what they say in this article. So what are the way forward in the sense? So the complete digitization of all the data is should be a major step in curbing the corruption, whatever happened in the PDS system or whatever happened in this DBT direct benefit transfer and deduplication of the beneficiary database. We all know that uh, certain people are applying for more than two, three beneficiary entitlements, uh, which is restricting the other people to get what they actually supposed to get. So deduplication or elimination of those ghost beneficiaries should, should also be ensured in order to uh, in order to implement this uh, DBT a successful one. So the next one is seeding of this bank account details and the other numbers into the database should also be uh, done to ensure the reaching of this DBT to each and every household. So this is what the RBI suggested every state to be more careful while implementing this DBT. So the third article is Harrier birds decline as grasslands disappear. So in this article what they are telling is in India, which is the largest roosting sites for this harrier birds, <coughs> especially for pallid harriers and montax harriers, uh, these are these harriers are a migratory raptor species in the sense they are like hawk or eagle or vulture kind of a thing. So th this population of harrier birds are now declining. So this is what the major concern or this is what the article tells about. So where it is mostly observed is the first one is the most dramatic changes or the most declining of the population of these harrier birds is observed at Rolapad Bustard Sanctuary in Andhra Pradesh, Karnul district. And in also at Hazargata outskirts of Bangalore also, this Mars Harrier bird, right? This Western Mars Harrier birds uh, population is nearly deserted in the sense it is nearly extinct. So these are all raising the concerns why they are actually the population is declining. So this is mainly due to the loss of grasslands because the grasslands are all the grasslands are getting reduced mainly due to urbanization or agricultural practices followed by us and also the farmlands which are the roosting sites for these vultures or these harrier birds is also burnt or overgrazed so that they couldn't be able to use in the future so excessive use of pesticides in the farms in and around these roosting sites of the harrier band harrier birds is also kills the grasshoppers which are the major primary prey for this harrier birds. So these are all the implications or the, these are all the reasons why this harrier birds are declining. What you have to observe here is in Central Asia the population of this harrier birds is not declining. There is no drastic change in their population in Central Asia. But the arrival of those birds to our country is declining. So which indicates that obviously the loss of habitat is taking place here. So what is the solution for this or what is the way forward? is conservation of the grassland by our country should be a major start in protecting these species. So the fourth article is golden jackal faces threat in its habitat. So the destruction of the mangrove cover is the major reason for their threat which means recently they observed in Bandar reserve forest that the destruction of mangrove cover uh, is leading to the forcing of the golden jackal out of its habitat as well as triggering the conflict with the local communities. So now it is like man-animal conflict, right? So you can observe. Even though the status of uh, this golden jackal is least concerned, we should take some immediate steps so that it is not going into vulnerable category. So what is the way forward is preventing the encroachment of the mangrove by the uh, human community should be a major step for uh, preserving this golden jackal for the future. So the next article is domestic tech security firms get priority in government purchases. So already we had public procurement order 2017. So under this, this, these two are the major aims to encourage the make in India and promote the manufacturing and production of goods and services in India itself. So this is what the major aim of this public procurement 2017 order. So it is also to enhance the income and employment of our citizens in the country. So under this order, we have something like the minimum order that should be procured by the each and every company should be at least 50% local uh, locally. So this is also a major step in improving the make in India as well as to provide employment to the citizens of the country. So making this provision as a way forward, what the IT ministry and the METI, which is the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology states is, they declare this tech security or the technological security as a strategic sector. In the sense, preferences should, preferences should be given to the uh, locally manufactured or domestically manufactured cyber security products than the imported ones. So this is what they are actually aiming at. So under this order, what the center is trying to insist is by means of making this cyber security as a strategic sector, 
all the public requirements of the cyber security products should be procured from the Indian companies or the Indian firms. So if you see in this picture, he, see here you can see India and the US have the largest cyber security talent pool. So we have to make use of that in order to make our e economy prosperous. So already US, China and Russia are actually started this process. So it is now imperative for India to start this process as well as to, to protect our information space as well as to uh, make our economy prosperous. The next article is a helping hand for Indian universities. So the future of the Indian universities or the higher education institutions including both private as well as public is not only in the hands of the government but it is also on the hands of individual, institutional as well as the corporate. So if at all you want to implement some uh, something in a higher education institution in a better way then obviously we need all these things work should work in tandem. So we already have some CSO responsibility which was initiated through this Companies Act 2013. So what is this CSO which is corporate social responsibility in the sense. So any companies that have a net worth of 500 crores or the turnover of 1000 crores or even the net profit of about 5 crores or exceed may be considered as a, a company that should abide by this corporate social responsibility. It is a way to look or to transform the relationship relationship between the business community or the corporate community and the society. For recent days, the, they are actually misinterpreting this corporate social responsibility. They started looking CSR as a charitable endeavor than their responsibility to the society. Also, it is the corporates that should play a major role or leadership role in contribu contributing to the society in one way or other, but they are not understanding the clear goals of CSR. So if you see here what in this article they suggest is, so CSR framework is not only for contributing to the social sectors but they could also be used for higher education and universities which need actually a more attention for the recent days. So rather than contributing to the social sectors, they can, e they can also contribute to the higher education and universities which are very necessary at the current context. So if we want our universities or the education, higher educational institutions to be at a good level or to be at a global, globally standard level, then we need all these things like um, hiring of world-class faculties in the institutions, developing research centers for the students, funding for the research projects, having rewards or incentives for the faculties as well as building the physical infrastructure as well as the scholarships to the students. So these are all uh, requiring the financial background which is only be provided by the corporates. So if the corporates are uh, able to understand this, they can now turn or shift their vision towards contributing to this higher education institutions rather than just to a charitable purposes. So what they also suggest is Ministry of Human Resource and Development should work together with Ministry of Corporate affairs to create or to develop a roadmap that incentivizes the CSR funding to be made available for the universities for their development. Few years back there were certain initiatives proposed to the private corporates to boost the higher education universities or higher education institutes like a free land for 999 years for a university by the uh, corporate companies also uh, like 300 percent deduction in their tax if at all a company is going to invest or boost this higher education institutions similarly 10 to 20 years of multiple visa entry for the research scholars so these are all some kind of uh, initiatives for implementing this CSR by the corporate companies but however it is not getting implemented so that is a major concern so you understand right recently we have this institute of eminence policy under which six institutes got this institute of eminence tag which means they are actually aimed at making these six universities to a global standard but though it creates the hopes and expectations for establishing these world-class universities in India it is also lacking the transparency in how they actually drafted the rules or how they select these six institutes into this eminence of tag etc so these are all the concerns um, these are all the recent concerns or major concerns so lead how they conclude here is leadership in philanthropy is central to enabling an institutional vision which will also help to build the future of the higher education in India in a very better way. Thank you.